Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to the, the second lecture within the sequencing informatics uh, section of this course. Today, we're going to be dealing with the somewhat dry topic of data types and file formats, but I promise it will be at least a little bit more interesting than it sounds. Um, there are six areas, six things I'd like to cover today. The first is just um, Kind of move carrying on a little bit from last week in terms of um, once we have a sequencing platform and we generate data, how do we actually convert the signal that's generated into bases? Then I'm going to introduce you to what's called the FASTA format and the FASTQ format. These are the two major ways that sequence data are, are stored and are used for um, uh, uh, used for aligning against genomes and so on. I'm going to talk a bit about the difference in single and paired end reads, what this means and what considerations you need to keep in mind when you're working with these sorts of data. Um, I'm going to give you a very basic overview of how aligning sequence data works, principally because I need to prepare you, I need to lay some groundwork, um, shall we say, for introducing uh, SAM files, which is going to be the main focus of the session today. So converting signal into bases, as we talked about on Tuesday, we've got several different sequencing platforms. We've got Lumina, we've got PacBio, we've got Oxford Nanopore. Um, each of these will produce readouts during, during the sequencing process. Um, and these readouts are in the forms of different types of signals. It may be fluorescence, it may be a colored image, it may be uh, a change in current um, in the case of Nanopore. I'm exemplifying what we would see with the Lumina here. And effectively, if you remember when uh, Lumina is sequencing by synthesis, so every time a base is added during the extension of the, of the, of the PCR step, um, that base will fluoresce. And depending on the color that fluoresces, you'll be able to, or in theory, a piece of software should be able to say whether it's going to be a T or a G or a C um, or so on. So for the most part, that works pretty well. Um, if you're doing something like nanopore sequencing, again, you'd just be looking at um, trying to match up a current profile against what you'd expect it to be for a base. Now, there is always going to be variability in it. So what you have is kind of a baseline where you say, okay, this is what this is the fluorescence we consider to be indicative of a base being called as a T. Um, however, there's going to be some variability within that. And depending on how far away a given reading is from that kind of ground truth, um, you may want to assign probabilities of, of, this, um, of this reading being correct. So what that basically means is every time you generate a base core, which is when we convert a piece of signal into a T or a G or a C, um, we also desire the ability to assign a probability value that tells us well, how likely is it that this is true. Uh, this is actually an incredibly important step as part of the sequencing protocol because a lot of the downstream tools that we use that you'll be introduced to over the next couple of weeks um, will often make use of these sorts of data in trying to make decisions on um, you know, where, how, where, how good an alignment is, where, where a particular read should align to, whether a SNP that is detected is real, or whether it might be some kind of artifact that has come from the base calling and so on and so forth. So most sequencing pipelines will make use of these probability values as part of the quality control. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so the way base core qualities are defined is using something called the FRED system. And this is just a very simple equation which looks to calculate the error probability um, relating to a base core. So, so the FRED scale runs from zero up to 60. Um, and it basically translates to a probability of an incorrect base core. So you can see the highest value is 60, and this means that you've got a 99.9999% chance of that base core being correct. Um, and obviously, if you drop down to a quality of 20 or 10, then you know, you're looking at maybe 99% accuracy or 90% accuracy. So what you should take away from this is that you know, most of the time, base cores are going to be pretty accurate. A lot of the time, um, they're going to be super accurate, um, but certainly as you're dealing with lower qualities, that's more likely when you will see um, errors or artifacts being introduced. So the way a FRED score is given, um, or sorry, the way it is stored, is that for each individual base, so let's say we've called a base as an A, um, it will then be given a character associated with that, and that character, which is derived from the fifth column here, um, the, the sort of teal colored column 
um, that character will be indicative of a decimal value. And the reason we desire the use of a character is we can have one character represent a two digit number or even a three digit number in some cases. Um, so this is basically an excellent system for reducing storage space, or savings, saving storage space. Um, within the FRED score, as I said, there are 60 values and these are basically defined from the decimal value 33 up to the decimal value 93. And you can see as I've highlighted here in red that each of these corresponds to a character uh, each of these corresponds to a single character that you'll find you know, on any given keyboard, pretty much. Um, what this allows us to do is to translate between numerical values and characters. So, for instance, the value of 33 would be the equivalent of an exclamation mark. The value of 35 would be the equivalent of a, of a hash and 40 of the, of the left-leaning bracket. Um, the way we then derive a quality score from that is simply through internal calculation. You always subtract 32 from your decimal value. So if a, if a base call is given a, an exclamation mark as its, as its value, we know that that exclamation mark equals 33. We subtract 32 from it. We know that its quality score is one, which is something incredibly low. Um, and you can imagine if you go higher up, you will get higher and higher quality scores right up to the maximum. Um, which would be 60. Now you need to bear in mind that um, different platforms have slightly different ways of dealing with these quality scores and some of them have different upper bounds. So some of them might go up to 60, some of them might only go up to 40. And this really leads to a problem which, um, or to, to a number of pitfalls really relating to the FRED system. So one is the way this quality scoring is done is it's based on various empirical properties of the data. So you know, how intense a cluster is, uh, perhaps on the flow cell, or how much signal to noise ratio there is, perhaps on the, in the nanopore device. Um, and then this is, this is kind of combined with what the companies will say are observations on actual error rates from known standard samples. Um, but the problem is that the calculation method becomes somewhat arbitrary, and it also becomes hidden a lot of the time within the proprietary software derived by companies. Uh, it can change, the method itself can change um, depending on the software, the chemistry and the hardware in the sequencing machine. So it basically means you could take the same sample, you could sequence it multiple times using different chemistries and different platforms, and you would find that you get slightly different values or slightly different, different distributions of values. So in some ways it's very useful, but in other ways you need to bear in mind that there's not a lot of cross compatibility when you're going between different technologies or between even different machines or chemistries within the same technology. And it's also worth noting that um, Q scores uh, take up a bit more data storage space than, um, than just the bases themselves. Um, and this of course will make files bigger. So this really leads us into the first of our file formats. So this, hopefully you're all familiar with, this. This is the most simple format of a, of a sequence uh, storage you can get, and this is called the FASTA format. It's basically two lines. The first line will always start with um, one of these greater than symbols, followed by what's termed a header, and the header can be in theory any text you want. Usually you try to encode useful information in there, so in this particular case, it's giving information about the sequencing machine that something has come from, or perhaps from the database it's come from, and it's giving you information on the read ID and the length of the read and so on. Um, it may also just have a simple name. So for instance, if you download a reference genome in faster format, often the name of the reference genome, so Homo sapiens or the chromosome number or something will be written as a header, and then the next line will contain the full sequence. So this is as simple as you get. Um, you can also get something called a multi-faster file, which as it sounds like is just a faster file that has multiple entries. Uh, and again, each entry will occupy two lines. Each will have its own unique header and its own unique sequence. And it will just um, kind of follow that flow. Now, a faster format is useful in some ways in that it doesn't take up a lot of space. Um, but most of the time people only would consider using it if they don't want to leverage base core quality information. However, if you want to layer in base core quality information, which is what most of us want to do when we're dealing with sequencing data, then you need to expand your FASTA file and turn it into what's called a FASTQ file. 
Now here we move away from a two line structure um, per entry to a four line structure. The first line remains a header line instead of a greater than symbol. It invariably starts with one of these at symbols. The rest of the line can be kind of kept the same and that you can have information about the read or you can have information about the sequencer that produced it or the online database you downloaded it for. The second line is the same as the FASTA file, it's just a sequence. The third line, um, originally there were some grand ideas for what this might be, um, but eventually everyone kind of got bored of it and it's just been left in as a placeholder to make sure that software that was designed in the past works properly with this. Um, so simply put, the third line is usually either just a copy of the header line, so it's exactly, exactly identical, or it's just truncated to just have this plus symbol um, at the left-hand end. So the third line you generally won't use for anything at all, but it's always important it's there so that any software that reads the FASTQ format um, still sees it as it's expected four lines um, per data point. The fourth line is where we actually add in the, uh, the data from the ASCII table. So these are all the characters which we can internally convert back into decimal values. So the plus character, five, you know, if we go back to our table, which we had here, we can say, okay, a five equates to 53 minus 32, so that's 21. Uh, so we know that that basis of red quality of 21. Um, and typically what you would see, even by eye, or at least as you become more used to doing this by eye, is that, you know, the first few bases in the read, the quality score would be a bit lower, then it will get better as you go through, and then maybe it'll drop a bit at the end. Um, it can vary like that. But that is the basis of a fast key file. Almost all fast key files are going to be in the multi fast key format, so you will have probably hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, or if you do sort of Illumina runs, you might even have sort of millions of uh, these four line entries in them. Uh, one for every single read that you've generated. Uh, I don't want to get too bogged down in the FAST5 format because that's pretty specific to nanopore sequencing. Uh, I just want you to be aware that with, if you ever do nanopore sequencing, that beyond generating the standard fast key files, which you would do with Illumina or with PacBi, you can also get access to lots of the signal information, um, the raw signal information that is kind of hidden behind the scenes that is used for the base calling. This can be super useful if you want to start looking at things like poly A tail length estimates, RNA modifications, and so on. Now, I don't imagine many of you will be working with Nanopore yet, but if you want to know more, I've got a couple of links here um, which will give you more information on, on how these file formats look and how they work and what you can do with them. So just be aware that that's out there and if you want to do nanopore, you may need to go into this raw signal data if you want to do some of the more complex analyses that it allows you to do. Okay, so next let's talk about um, single versus paired end reads. So this is something which effectively is Illumina specific, at least as far as the three technologies we're kind of talking about at the moment. So PacBio and um, Nanopore, they will generate single end reads. Um, with Illumina, you can generate single end reads or you can generate paired end reads. Now, if you remember from the lecture on Tuesday, uh, we know that when an Illumina, uh, we know that when a DNA fragment or a RNA that's been made into cDNA fragment, we do end repair, we like eight adapters on the end. So I'm showing a fragment here with the source DNA in these two red colors, and then the adapters on the end. When we perform single end sequencing, um, what we're basically doing is generating one read from each of our fragments, and this read will encompass the adapter sequence, and then it will read into the to our template of interest. How far it reads into it depends on the size of the fragment and how many cycles you're doing. So that's single end sequencing. Paired end sequencing, what you can be doing is sequencing first from one end and then sequencing from the other end. And what this basically means is you're generating two reads from each individual fragment and that these two reads are linked because you know they come from the same fragment. Now, if you were to look in a FASTA file or a FASTQ file, you would often find these two reads have either exactly the same name or exactly the same name with the number one or number two after them, depending on whether it's the read one or the read two. But remember, the bad end sequencing is pretty much specific only to Illumina. So why do you do paired end sequencing? Um, in the most cases, particularly when you're working with short read data, it's 
considered a better way to resolve difficult regions. So you can imagine that if you are doing, um, so let's look over here on the right hand side where it says alignment to reference sequence. You can imagine if we we're doing single end sequencing and we just captured sequence shown here in the blue, when you hit a repeat region, you wouldn't know whether this, whether this particular blue would map to this bit or whether it would map to this bit. However, by sequencing from the other end of the fragment, assuming that other end of the fragment lies within the unique region, it becomes an anchoring point, which allows you to then estimate which of these two regions it's most likely to map to. Um, so paired end sequencing is generally a more powerful approach when it comes to Illumina. There are some applications where it's not useful. Um, for instance, small, small RNA sequencing, microRNA sequencing, um, certain types of uh, RNA modifications like M6A, you might want to skip some of the paired end sequencing and just do single end. Um, that will save you time and cost. Um, but for the most part, particularly if you're doing things like RNA seq and so on, personally, I would always recommend working with paired end data. So there are challenges that come from sequencing these short fragments, um, not least the fact that the fragments can be, uh, can be variable in their size. So in a typical scenario, this is what we would hope to see. Um, we have our fragment, we've sequenced the R1 and we've sequenced the R2. The R1 and the R2 do not overlap and we have a small region of kind of unknown sequence between them. But that's okay, we're gonna sequence to sufficient depth that those regions will get filled in by other fragments in the run. However, in some cases you will find fragments that are short enough or maybe you'll do a read length that is long enough that you start to generate an overlap. So part of your R1 and part of your R2 read overlap. Now you have to be super careful how you deal with this from an alignment point of view and from a downstream analysis point of view, because you could very easily end up in a situation where you count both of these reads um, in a depth calculation or in a variant or in a snip calling calculation. And it can basically bias, um, it can basically impact your depth, depth calculation or your you know, varying calling calculation and lead to inaccurate estimates. So you always need to be aware that probably some proportion of your data is going to look like this and you're going to need to find a way to try and deal with that. The way people mostly do it is they look at the overlap region and they remove the overlap region from one of the two sequences. Typically it's from the R2 because the R2 sequence generally is slightly lower quality than the R1 sequence. Um, you can also have more complicated scenarios where the R1 and the R2 region overlap, but they overlap to such an extent that actually the read will read all the way through um, your template and actually into the adapter at the other end. And this can also be a problem in single end sequencing, for instance, microRNA sequencing. Um, and what this can do is have significant impacts on how well your data will align against a reference genome. And you may find that you lose a lot of data that is not aligning properly. So here you would need to implement a strategy of first trimming this additional adapter sequence um, using different types of trimming software. And then you'd still need to go back and to remove the overlap. So really all I'm trying to exemplify here is that um, anytime you do a, an Illumina run, particularly if you're generating uh, paired end data, but also if you're generating single end data, you can run into these situations of adapter read through, or in the case of paired end data, this overlap. And you need to find a way to treat that before you go too far down your analysis pipeline and start um, getting dodgy data. So then the next thing I just want to talk about is kind of a very brief overview of um, sequence alignment. Um, and it's important, first of all, to distinguish between the terms alignment and assembly. Um, this is something which, even in published papers, people tend to get a bit convoluted about. Uh, alignment, quite simply, is when you have a reference genome in place and you are aligning your sequence read data against it. Assembly, so one of the classic example of this would be you have a puzzle, um, you have a box with a picture on, and you can, you can remake the puzzle quite effectively. Now, in some situations, the picture on the box may be subtly different from what you end up making. Um, that's fine, at least in the sequencing context, because of course there's variations between organisms and within organisms. Um, but when people are talking about assembly, they're typically talking about trying to put together a puzzle where you don't have a picture and you don't have any idea necessarily what it's gonna look like. But everything we're talking about today and pretty much everything we're gonna talk about throughout this course is all predicated on the assumption we are taking sequence data and we are aligning it against a reference genome. 
So the very basic principles of sequence alignment are one, obtain the sequence data. So this is your raw reads. Um, now, most of the time you'll get this from a sequencing platform or a sequencing core, um, but you may also want to kind of scour the internet and go to some of the online repositories and download data from there. The next step is quality control and quality trimming. And this is really just to try and uh, remove things like excess adapter sequences or to remove bases that have um, low base core quality values. And this is something that will be covered in a couple of weeks time. Um, and then comes the key part, which is aligning your trimmed quality control data against a reference genome. And to do this, you need to choose a piece of mapping software or a, or a sequence aligner. You need to have a good reference genome, possibly with some good annotations. Um, and you feed this together and this produces your alignment versus a reference. Then you can go off in different directions depending on what you're interested in doing. You may want to do variant calling if you're sequencing genomes and looking, at, uh, looking for new mutations or something like that. Uh, and this can also lead to things like annotation of variants, or you may want to go down a transcriptome-based pathway and do differential gene expression analysis, looking at the abundance of transcripts un in an organism under different conditions. You know, maybe you're treating your cells with drugs, or maybe you're infecting them with viruses, or any of these sorts of things. So this really comes under the processing and passing data and the analysis part. Now, most of the time when you're working with read pairs, so paired end data, um, you will always expect it, you should always expect it to align um, where the R1 read and the R2 read are aligning within a certain distance, they're aligning toward each other and they're, and they're mapping to opposite strands. Now sometimes there will be a gap between them, sometimes there'll be an overlap, both of those are good scenarios. In both of these cases, we refer to a read as being properly paired. And this will become important later on. However, you can also get situations where, for instance, two reads will map either to the same strand or maybe different strands, um, but they map in the same direction, um, as is uh, exemplified here. Um, you may find they're mapping in opposite directions, but not the opposite you want, not toward each other, away from each other. You may find that only one read is mapping and the other doesn't seem to map anywhere in the genome. Or you may find situations where they map further apart than what you would expect, given you know there is this restriction on the fragment sizes that you can generate. Now, some of these problems can be controlled and can be sorted out by having proper parameters specified to whichever piece of alignment software you use, but sometimes these can also reflect a biological reality um, that could be very interesting. So in a couple of cases here, we're talking about um, LR, which is basically left read, right read, facing each other. This is a, a properly paired read. This is what it would look like with the Lumina. However, if you have two reads mapping together on the same strand in the same direction, um, this could imply that there's an inversion with respect to your reference. Um, similarly, if they're facing away from each other, this could imply that there's some kind of duplication or translocation with respect to the reference. So if you're analyzing data, you know, maybe in the cancer capacity or something like that, um, you may see some of these things as being real. Um, you may also find sometimes these things arise just as artifacts of the sequencing, uh, of the sequence alignment process because of how you specify your parameters or because you're dealing with low complexity regions and so on. So you just, so one of the things you always need to make sure you do is just have a little analysis after aligning your data, just to get a sense of, you know, how many reads are properly paired, how many are improperly paired. And the ones that are improperly paired, what do they look like? Where are they in the genome? Can you figure out why um, they are like this? Is it, is it biologically informative or is it just some kind of artifact um, of the process? Okay, so this really brings us into the kind of the nitty gritty of today. So um, you'll get some experience, I think, in a couple of weeks of actually learning how to do the alignment of the data. But whenever you align data against a reference genome, invariably the first file output at the end is going to be called a SAM file. And SAM stands for the Sequence Alignment Map Format. This was something that was um, generated many years ago, back in the early 2000s, I think. Um, it's considered the standard and by far the best text-based format for storing reads aligned against a reference genome. Um, pretty much any piece of software you use will output SAM as standard. Um, any, any sequence alignment software will output SAM as standard. There's one or two other formats, but we're not going to get into them because nobody really uses them. 
Um, as I will show you, the SAM is a simple 11 plus one column tab delimited file. In theory, it's great because you could look at it in the text browser or a text viewer. Uh, the reality is they're usually gigabases in size, so you can't because it will break your computer. Um, it comes in two flavors, which I'll mention a little bit more about earlier, SAM and BAM. BAM is just a binary compressed version. It saves a lot of space. Um, and that just makes it kind of easier to, to carry around and to store locally. Um, and to, yep. um, processing of um, SAM and BAM files is done with something called SAM tools, and I provided a link here. This is a piece of software you're going to get very familiar with um, probably over the next few weeks. Um, it's basically a I describe it as a simple toolkit, it's a, it's a very com it's a very impressive toolkit actually. It allows you to do a huge amount of filtering and analysis of your data um, to basically get everything ship shape and the way you want it to be before you go and do all your important complex downstream analysis. It's also, it's got some ability to do things like filtering duplicate reads and bearing calling. I would argue it does both of those badly. And there are other solutions, and this is something which we discussed um, as we go forward. Something important to remember is that the, the SAM format goes, undergoes periodic updates to ensure it's compatible with the latest software. Uh, and every time they do an update, they release a new specification. Most of the time, it's not going to have any impact on you, but it's always worth having a quick browse of it just to see what has changed. Uh, and I'll mention a little bit more about that later on. So this is me just um, printing a, a, the first few lines of the SAM file to the screen from my terminal. Um, as you can see, it looks quite messy. Um, when there's 12 columns of data, it's often quite hard to see. You need quite a big screen for it, um, or it's going to look like this. But what I really want to draw your attention to is the structure of the SAM file. So first of all, there is a header row, um, or so, sometimes several rows. Each of these header rows will start with the, the app symbol and then a couple of characters that will denote something um, relating to, uh, to the software. So in this particular case, we've got an SQ line, and this is basically telling us what is the name of the reference sequence that was used. In this case, I was uh, aligning my data against a viral genome called HSV1 pattern US11 GFP. It will tell me what the length of that is. Um, so this just becomes a little bit of a sanity check in a way, just to make sure you know what you're looking at. Uh, the PG gives you information on how the actual read alignment was done. So it's basically here, it's telling me, okay, which piece of software did I use? A software called BBMap, which um, I'm a big fan of. Which version of the software? And what was the command line that I, was, that I used? So here I can basically check and see all the different options that were specified, uh, all the different parameters, sorry, that were passed to the software, which allows me to then go back and better understand what I did. So if I return to this file in a couple of years, um, I would have an idea of how I generated it, what I generated it against, um, and that's obviously going to be a very useful thing to do. The full details of um, header rows along with everything else are, as I say, in the SAM specification. If you click on this link here, this should take you to the latest version of it. Uh, as I say, every few months it's worth having a look because there's usually a new update. Um, so I would not describe a SAM file as 12 columns of fun other than on a day like this. Um, but I do want to talk you through what each of the columns mean so you have a good understanding of it. Because being able to filter SAM files and knowing which columns are pertinent um, for that kind of filtering can save you a lot of time and it can make your analysis pathway a lot, lot easier. So we'll start with the first six. So the first six, uh, the, the first column will always tell you the name of the sequence read. So the most important thing to remember with a SAM file is every single line represents a single read alignment against a genome. Now it is possible that a single read could have multiple alignments and there will therefore be multiple entries for that particular read. Um, yeah, so always just kind of bear that in mind. Um, interesting, well, importantly, the name of the sequence read will always match exactly the same header as is in your FASTQ file that you used for the alignment. Um, and that's very important because that means you can kind of cro do some crosstalk between them. And if you want to filter your FASTQ file at a later point, you can, you can easily extract the read names and, and go back and look at that. <clears throat> 
The second column is something called the alignment flag. And this is basically giving you a huge amount of information in a very simple way as to how and where your readers aligned in the genome. And we'll talk about this a bit more in a minute. The third column is basically telling you the chromosome that the alignment has gone against. Now, in my case, I'm using a viral genome, so it's just a single chromosome. If you're aligning against human, you would see this would say maybe chromosome one, chromosome one, chromosome seven, nine, all the different chromosomes. Um, so yeah, so that, that's a quick way of tracking down where a particular read is mapping. Column four will tell you the leftmost mapping coordinate of, of the alignment. So if it's aligning to the top strand, uh, it will tell you the leftmost position relative, uh, sorry, the leftmost position on the top strand. Um, so in this case, it'd be 27,749. Uh, and this would be the five prime end of the read if it's on the top strand. If it's on the bottom strand, then it would tell you the three prime position um, of that read, which still would be the leftmost position, if you think of the genome from left to right. Column five contains a mapping quality. And again, this can be an important parameter for filtering and for understanding what your data look like. And column six has something called a cigar score. And we'll have some fun talking about that later on. Okay, then moving along to the remaining columns. Column seven is a, is a tricky column. So if you're doing single end sequencing, then column seven will always have a, um, I think it's an asterisk, because basically it's telling you Column seven, seven is telling you what the name of the, of, the, of the other read in the pair is. If you're doing single end sequencing, you don't have a second pair, so that will be, um, be a star. If your reads have different names, if your read pairs have different names, then that will be in there. If it has an equal sign, then it's actually telling you that the, that the second read has exactly the same name as the first read. Um, Column eight is telling you the leftmost position of the mate, and the mate is, the, is another way of saying you know, the, other, the other read and the paired end read. Um, and from that, it is able to calculate fragment size. So here it's basically working out the size of the, of the, of the, of the sequence fragment. Uh, and this can be important because this allows you to go away and say, well, actually, how big are the fragments that I'm generating? Are they well, how big are the fragments, sorry, um, the sequence fragments that I'm aligning, do they correspond to roughly what I expect based on the fragments that I generated during my library preparation step? Column 10 will tell you the sequence that has actually been aligned, so the part of the read that has been aligned against the genome. Column 11 will carry, forth the, carry forward the base core qualities that came from the fast key file, so again, this can be taken into downstream processing, which is very useful. And then column 12 contains additional flags. Now, the makeup of these flags, the number of these flags depends entirely on the software you use for alignment and also the parameters you set. Sometimes you can have literally tens if not hundreds of flags in there. Other times you may just have uh, one or two or three. Um, the meaning of them is highly variable, as I say, dependent on the software. So really you will need to go away and look at the software and you need to go look in the SAM spec file to understand what they mean. A lot of the time you can skip them, they're not super, they're not super useful, but sometimes you may still want to. So in this case, we can see that the AM flag is recording the, um, the, the, the mapping quality, so the column five data, and the NM flag is telling you which read, whether it's the R1 read or whether it's the R2 read. So in this particular example here, we can see the first two read alignments, they both have exactly the same name, the read. Um, we can see that the positions, I'm not sure if you can see this, you can see that the positions um, of its alignment and of the mate um, are basically the same. So 27902, 27902. And we can see from the NM1 and the NM2 flag that this is read one, this is read two. So what we have here are two reads from the same fragment. Um, they have pretty similar mapping qualities, pretty similar cigar scores. Um, they have the same fragment sizes and they have slightly different alignment flags, which is again going to be important going forward. So hopefully that gives you a rough idea of what the structure of a, of a SAM file looks like. It will never look particularly different from this other than the fact that the read names, the style of the read names may be different. 
the chromosome may be different and the flags may be different, but everything else should be pretty much the same. So let's move on to alignment flags. So this is column two. So this is basically giving you lots of information about how are your readers aligning, where it's aligning and the context of its alignment. So I've shown a little clip, uh, I've shown a little highlight here on the right hand side. You can see we've got a bunch of reads from a sound file and then we've got a bunch of different scores here, alignment flag scores. So what we can do is basically convert these scores um, into meaning. So in this particular case, I would say the first one we see is 99. So what we're doing is we're going through this table and we're trying to find which unique combination of these numbers allows you to add up to 99. In this case, it's 1, 2, 32, and 64. So what this is telling is, is regarding this first read here, that this read comes from a pair. So we've got paired end sequencing, so a score of 1. This read is mapped in a proper pair, so that means the orientation is correct. Um, both of this read and of its R2 read, uh, and of its second read. It's telling us that the mate, so that the, the other read, is mapping to the reverse strand, which by inference we can mean, we can work out that uh, this current read is mapping to the top strand. And it's telling us that the current read is the first in the pair, so it's the R1 read. Um, so yeah, so that's basically how, how that would work. So that all adds up to 99, so we can make that inference. If we were to look at the next read here, um, which has a score of 147, to get to 147, we'd basically have to do 1, 2, 16, and 128. Um, and this would tell us read paired, read in the proper pair, that the, read, that the R2 read is mapping to the reverse strand, and that it's the second read in the pair. So, so hopefully that gives you an idea of how that works. There are more complicated flags as you move on, um, such as not primary alignment and supplemental alignment, and we'll talk a bit more about those as we go forward. Uh, one more example, yep, if we want to get to 147, this is how we do it, 1, 2, 16, and 128. Um, so yeah, so most of the time if you have reads mapped in a proper pair, you're going to see them in this 99 and 147 or 83 and 163. If you see 83, it's basically telling you that you've got 1, 2, uh, let me remember this here, 1, 2, 16 and 64. So in this case, you have the R1 and the R2 in the opposite or orientation but still facing each other. This is less important for DNA sequencing, but when you go into RNA sequencing, Filtering based on these flags allows you to actually extract reads mapping to individual strands, which can be a very powerful way of looking at um, transcription patterns across genes and, and for detecting things like uh, antisense transcription and so on. Okay, um, so a quick word on primary, secondary and supplementary alignments. So this is where things can get quite complicated. So a single read or a read pair can have one or more primary alignments against a reference. And by primary alignment, I mean the best possible alignment. Now in theory, you would hope a read is only gonna have one, but the reality is sometimes it can map to multiple places equally well. Um, now when that happens, pretty much every piece of software out there will only select one of these hits as being its primary alignment. And indeed, SAM tools generally will only allow you to flag one of these alignments as being primary. And the remainder of them, you have to be, you have to be flagged as secondary alignments. And by secondary alignments, um, I mean not primary. Um, now, the choice of which one the primary alignment is is often random, but in certain softwares, you can also influence that by picking certain parameters. Um, and what you need to bear in mind is, you know, if you see a primary alignment, if you see a read has one primary alignment and maybe three or four secondary alignments, you can't just assume that throwing away the secondary alignments is appropriate behavior, because actually one of those could be the true correct alignment. You may not. So you have to find a way of dealing with that, um, which is, of course, going to depend on the question you're asking and the biological context and so on. Secondary alignments are particularly common where you have low complexity regions or repeat regions, um, or if you get structural variation. So again, more investigation is usually required to understand if this is something important to the, to the question at hand. Uh, supplementary alignments are different. A supplementary alignment occurs when two non-overlapping sections of a sequence read align to distinct locations. 
Um, so again, you might see this in, in the structural variation. So you can imagine if you have a fusion between two chromosomes and you have a sequence read that is read across that fusion point, when you take that and you align it back against the reference, you'll see part of your read is aligning to one chromosome and part of it is aligning to another one. Um, similarly, in RNA-seq data sets, you may see this where you have transcripts that uh, come from an overlapping region. So if a gene, if a gene produces multiple transcriptized forms, for instance. Um, so again, you just need to be aware of these. Sometimes you can throw them out and, and ignore them. Other times they're actually critical for your analysis and may impart lots of uh, biological wisdom to you. The fifth column of the SAM file is another tricky one. Um, and this is, refers to the mapping quality. So this is um, again calculated in a way not too dissimilar to how FRED score calculations is done. Um, it's a sort of a probability basis for working out how likely a position is to be, uh, how, li how, how likely an alignment is to be true or how accurate it is. Um, it's typically scored from about 1 to 50, but the scoring does vary between software, and this is a big problem. So in this case, I'm giving you an example of um, a piece of software called BWA. BWA calculates mapping quality as a function of the edit distance and the uniqueness of the alignment. Now, what is fairly standard to most softwares is that if a mapping quality of zero is given, it's telling you that a read has multiple possible alignments, um, and it's, it usually means that it has, multi, it has multiple secondary alignments. So it's mapping equally well to multiple positions and it doesn't know which one is the best. If you have a, a value above, above zero, then it's basically giving you a, a graduated score as to how good a hit is. As a general rule, anything from one to about seven or eight, um, people will throw out. Anything above that, they will keep. But again, it depends on the software and it depends on the questions that you're asking. And this is where you need to be super careful because the MAPQ scores are hugely variable between different aligners. So if you take the same data set and you align it with BBMAP, with Bowtie, with Bowtie 2, with BWA, you're going to see very, very different results for individual reads. Um, so you need to be careful about cross comparing and you need to be very careful about the decisions you make in these contexts. As a general rule, I always keep um, anything with a mapping quality is zero, um, anything that's multiply aligned because I want to filter it out by different methods or look at it by different methods. But anything with a mapping quality of between say one and seven, I will often get rid of. Uh, and then this brings me on to my favorite part, which are cigar schools. Um, so cigar means compact idiosyncratic Gapped alignment report, which to me means that somebody really wanted the acronym SIGAR. Um, this again is a descriptor of how well your read is aligning to the reference. And what it is, um, is basically a, a, a table that can be looked up that tells you um, how the read is aligning from left to right. So in this particular example here, um, when you do a loop, when you're using a lumina data, you usually get very simple SIGAR strings. So one example would be 34M. And what this is telling you is that 34 bases of your read are aligning to the reference and they're aligning contiguously and they're aligning um, sort of perfectly. So the reference base and the read base is exactly the same. Another scenario might see something like 12M, 1I, 13M. This is telling you that the first 12 bases of your read align to the reference, but then within your read, you have a one base insertion that is not found in the reference. And then the remaining 13 bases of your read um, align again contiguously to the reference genome. Uh, in another case here, we're saying we have um, 2S, 14M, 2N, 20M. Um, so S basically means soft clipping, which basically means that the software is just removing a little bit of the sequence that it's not happy with. Uh, then you get 14 matches, and then it's giving you it's a bad example. Um, the N is usually defined as being a skipped region, and it's usually seen in RNA-seq data, um, so it would be an intron. But obviously, introns are usually longer than two bases, um, so I should really have changed this to 20 or 200 or something. And then the remaining 20 um, bases or so match perfectly. So getting an overview of what your cigar scores look like can be quite useful. Um, it can help you just... Um, well, it can help you get a sense of where mutations are or where there are sequence variations or so on. Um, it's also very useful in different types of transcriptomics work. 
If you ever work with long read sequencing, um, then cigar scores become a huge problem, uh, principally because long reads are far, far longer and they're far noisier. There's a lot more errors. So they start to look something like this. And honestly, this would be considered a good case. Um, often they're just unreadable. So then just going back briefly to SAM tools. Um, so just a, a reminder, this is a very versatile suite of software um, designed for the analysis and processing of SAM files. It's mainly used to filter unwanted reads. So if you're doing an RNA-seq experiment and you just want to look at a certain region, you might want to use SAM tools to first of all, throw away any reads that don't map to that region. And then maybe you want to separate the reads out so you can look at the ones that align just to the top strand or just to the bottom strand. Um, when you're converting SAM files to BAM files, you may want to throw away any reads that happen to align to, with your reference, possibly because they're from another organism. And by throwing those away, you reduce the size of your BAM file, which makes it more kind of practical to move around, to carry around. Uh, you may find you have some reads that produce chimeric alignments, and depending on the biological question, you may just want to get rid of these because you don't like them. Um, and the other thing, SAM tools are useful then is converting to a BAM file, which is this sort of compressed binary format. And then also to do kind of rapid sorting and indexing of the files so that it can be quickly and easily accessed by different software. You'll need to bear in mind that SAM files and BAM files are often many, many gigabases and sizes, um, and it can become very unwieldy. So anything you can do to kind of you know, reduce the size, to index, um, to get stuff sorted in a sensible order will make your life much, much easier, much quicker. Again, you can see um, full instructions for how to do how to run SAM tools here. I think it will be demoed to you in the next couple of weeks or so. Um, but if you're ever going off and working on this solo in the future, I still spend a significant amount of my life reading through this documentation because there's always new little tricks and things that I find um, that make everything better. So that pretty much covers everything that I wanted to talk about today. So we've talked about converting signals into bases, fast A format, fast Q format, also fast five format, um, single and paired end reads, basic principles of sequencing alignment, of aligning sequencing data, sorry, and the SAM format. Now, the hope is that this will kind of prepare you for what's coming up in the next few weeks. And again, we'll put these slides online and hopefully you will refer back to them when you start generating data yourself and trying to understand what it is that you have. Um, I also wanted to just recommend a few different bits of reading to you. Um, if you wanted to know more as a follow-up um, to the sequencing talk I gave earlier in the week, this first paper, The Sequence of Sequences, History of DNA, Sequencing DNA, um, is an extremely good overview. It's relatively short, but it covers all the major, uh, major topics, so I'd suggest a read of that. Um, if you are in any way serious about doing informatics and working with the uh, sequence data, you have to read this paper because this will basically tell you everything you want to know about the SAM format and SAM tools. This paper is kind of a funny one. It's, um, it's not even archived in NCBI and it's published in a slightly odd journal. But having read it, I actually think it's a really good paper um, that tells you a lot about computational errors and biases in short read Illumina sequencing data. And again, reading this and trying to absorb um, some of the messages in it could make your life a lot easier. Uh, and then actually a friend asked me um, recently, why do I never use the term next generation sequencing in my talk? Uh, so I will refer you to this blog post that was written by someone else about why next generation sequencing is a horrible, horrible term and should never be used. Um, so if you want a little giggle, it's worth going having a read of this blog and also the follow-up blog. Um, to it. So thank you for everything. Um, if you'd like to know more, uh, I think you can go on the Slack channel and ask questions. I will take a look through the chat in just a second and see if there's anything that I can answer now.